All right, y'all. So on today's show, I have not one, but two of my favorite humans in the personal finance space. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I've already had the honor of being on their show. So I'm so excited to have them here. We have Justin and Haley of uh, The Price of Avocado Toast it's a podcast and a platform. And uh, welcome to Yo Quiero Dinero, guys. Oh, my God. Thank you so much for having us. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Thank you so much for inviting us on. You know, I love you guys because y'all are like one of the few non-problematic folks in the personal finance community who are, you know, of the Caucasian flavor. (laughs) (laughs) This is why you're invited on my show because there's just a lot of like that fucking bro finance shit. And you guys are like so opposite of that. And that's why I love you. And when I met y'all, at FinCon this year, like in person, I was like, these are my people. These are my fucking people. So I'm so excited that we get to be here and talk about your incredible journey into the personal finance space. Because, you know, talking to so many people at this point, this is not something that any of us plan. It just kind of happens. And so let's start off with you guys giving us just a little introduction of how you got into this space. This is always a fun story because it was so unplanned. If I look back, like, three or four years ago, and someone told me we'd be here today, I'd be like, you're fucking crazy. No, (laughs) absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely not. Okay, why don't you tell our story, the finance story that kind of got us to starting the podcast, which then projected us into the personal finance space. Yeah, definitely. So I'm Justin, and I'm married to Haley. We met in 2015. And in January of 2016, I received a wrongful death lawsuit payout. My grandmother passed away from mesothelioma, which is asbestos caused lung cancer. And in the process of her passing, my grandfather filed a lawsuit against the company that was found to be negligent in that process. And so I received a $600,000 payout. The payout was actually $1 million, but I had to pay lawyer's fees. So I received two checks in January of 2016. One was for $60,000 and the next one was for $540,000. He was 24 years old and I was 23 years old. (laughs) That's a huge thing we need to include. (laughs) Yeah. And so we basically just got that money and we had both been raised by single parents who did the best they could, but did not have the financial empowerment skills to teach us what was the smart and safe things to do with our money. And so we blew through it pretty darn fast. Within about three years, we had blown through all of that money and gotten into over $200,000 worth of debt. And so we realized that we were not doing things right. Woke up one morning and I felt an immense feeling of failure. Like I was not holding up my end of the bargain when I told Haley what I was planning to do for her as a husband and as a father to our future children. And I came home that night and we said, we've got to clean it up. And so we started to clean it up. And within about 18 months, we had paid off over $130,000 worth of debt. And in that process started the podcast, which I'll let Haley kind of talk about how that led us to where we are today. The adventure of paying off debt was a very isolating, lonely journey. And I felt like all we did was talk about paying off debt and saving money to an empty void that didn't care about what we were talking about. And that's a no fault to any of those people, but they just didn't understand what we were going through on the level that we were going through it. So I needed an outlet and we were (laughs) in 2020, the original quarantine and, you know, drinking a little too much wine one night doing like a Q and a on Instagram. And someone goes, you guys are funny. You should start a YouTube. And I'm like, nah, we should do a podcast. And then we started our podcast and that brought us to Instagram, which then all of it grew into this brand. And here we are in the personal finance space. And I just find it so funny looking back that like it was four years ago, we were in a financial shithole. And now we're like, oh, I get to teach people daily how to better their finances and not make the same epic mistakes that we made. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. It's so wild. It's such a full circle moment. And I think for me, I just found time and time again, it's those catastrophes that are the catalyst for a change. Like 
when you said that number, like $600,000, and then another 200, like my heart stopped a little bit. I'm like, holy shit. And going through that, like, how do you not let those types of numbers, like, just say, make you say, like, fuck it. I'm just never going to be good with money. How did you get past the mental block that it takes to make those changes? Because I think that's step one, right? That's a really good question. And when we were on our financial journey, we were originally following Dave Ramsey. And I mean, drinking the Kool-Aid down to the tea and that I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> However, I feel like we didn't really think much outside of like, we messed up, we need to fix this. And then after we worked really hard and we paid off a bunch of debt, I feel like the shame actually came later. Initially, we were just in hustle mode. It was kind of easy to just like, okay, mm -hmm. put our heads down. We're both really hard workers. It came relatively smooth for us to be like, all right, we're going to get on the same page pay this off, do whatever it takes. Okay, but then when it was done, now what? That was the hard part. That's when all of the shame really started to spiral after the fact, which is kind of ironic. Yeah. I think the other benefit is also just that we had each other. We were able to commiserate together on the days that are really hard. And I don't want to like brag on us, but Haley and I, I think are a really good partnership. Like just as teammates in general, we're crazy about one another still five years. Y'all are like married. hashtag couples goals. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're up there on the pedestal for me. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I'm just constantly amazed at like how blessed I am to have Haley as a partner. And on the days that were really hard for me, I could come to her and say like, this is not easy. And I'm really frustrated that I blew my grandma's legacy. Or I'm really frustrated that I didn't have this figured out because you and I wouldn't have to work so hard right now. And we wouldn't have to be losing time with our baby to take care of this problem that we got ourselves into. And she was able to like listen and hear me. And so I think there is a huge benefit in having a partner that's going through it with you as well. I know that for a lot of folks that are solo on the journey, it can be really hard. Absolutely. And so that's when you have to be really intentional about creating that community around you that's going to support you and get you to your goals, whether that's just like somebody motivating you or somebody like actually giving you information, tips or somebody going on the journey with you. You know, you can do this debt payoff stuff with a friend, a cousin, doesn't necessarily have to be a partner. So just find somebody else who's like committed to making changes in their finances and tag team, right? It's the same thing you would do if you want to go to the gym more often, you probably want a gym buddy. So let's talk about the actual steps that you took to get rid of over $130,000 worth of debt, because that is no small number. And I think like when people think about paying off six figures or debt, there's like never going to happen. So what did you guys do? I want to start this with a huge disclaimer that we came from a massive place of privilege because we had $600,000. Not all of it was invested terribly. Therefore, we were able to liquidate some of our assets and pay certain things off. So mm -hmm. immediately we paid off $16,000 yep, by 16, selling 000. Justin's car. Mm -hmm. And then like a year later, we sold my car. These are paid off relatively newer vehicles yeah. that we bought with the original $600,000. And so we were able to just sell those and pay off a combination of like $45,000 just between the two cars that we got rid of. And we didn't go carless. We then got downgraded older cars. But that was one thing we did initially. We also did a couple things that I would not recommend. We cashed out Justin's contributions to his Roth IRA. Yeah, there were a lot of mistakes along the way. There, However, was, there was only about 16000 in there in contributions. So not massive, but certainly something we wouldn't recommend for anybody. One of the benefits was that almost exact number was close to what we had left in credit card debt. So that got rid of all of our credit cards, those high interest debts pretty quick, which again, you know, we wouldn't recommend now, but it was the Kool-Aid that we were drinking kind of made us think that that was what was important in the moment. Justin was an elementary school teacher at the time, and he was also working a side job bartending and serving and like a part-time manager at a restaurant. So anything extra, all of the tips and the wages from that job went to all of our debt. And then thankfully, the timing of our debt payoff was during COVID. Therefore, we didn't have to spend much money because we just stayed inside and did nothing for a good year. And any extra windfall of money, and I'm talking tax return, stimulus money, child tax credit money, anything like anything. that immediately went towards debt. And it just made it go much faster. 
Yeah. Can we talk about what the debt was actually composed of? Like, was it credit cards, student loans, a combination? Tell me more about that. Yeah, we had 130 ish thousand dollars combined of our student loans. We had $27,000 of credit card debt. We had a $50,000 car loan, a $12,000 timeshare loan. Yeah, I think that's right. The car loan eventually at that point had been taken care of because we were foolish with money. So we took out a home, re- refinanced the home that we had purchased. We didn't pay for it outright, but we we refinanced the home and originally had paid off the vehicle. So that was kind of part of the debt that was wrapped into that as well. We still do have some student loans. We're waiting to see kind of what happens with the student loan forgiveness, but we have the money to take care of them when that time comes. So we're talking right now, mid-February. Is the student loan program still like on hold as far as payments? Are they still on 0% interest? Yes. Okay. Is there any update on to when that's supposed to end? Yeah. At the end of February, the Supreme Court is going to be hearing the case. Their ruling should come in June and payments are set to continue in September. So we should know by then kind of what that's going to look like and what we'll be paying. We still do have 90,000 of student loans to pay off between the two of us. So we'll see what that comes to. Oh, damn, these student loans. I mean, like, you know, I think back to (laughs) Dave Ramsey's generation and the fucking privilege that he has to talk about, like, yeah, it's just need to work harder and stop eating avocado toast. I have a feeling that's one of the reasons why you guys put that in your, is your title for your podcast. Uh, <laughs> am I clued in? Yeah, definitely. When we were thinking of what we should call it, somebody said on Instagram, they said the cost of avocado toast, kind of playing on millennials and being a language arts teacher. I was like, ah, uh, the vowel sounds of cost and avocado toast don't sound good. So let's call it price. And, uh, and it's stuck. Yeah. <laughs> that's so good. Okay, so I think debt payoff has its merits, right? Like Dave Ramsey makes it the center of his whole fucking brand. And it's just like, okay, that's great that you're debt free. But like, if you're not investing, if you're not like doing things to increase your income, building wealth, you're only doing a small portion of like what it takes to actually get rich like him. And I always find that ironic how like his generation of personal finance gurus, if you will, just focuses on making people feel stupid about first getting into debt and then like, not understanding concepts like interest as if anybody explains it to us or isn't he of the belief too that like you should not use credit cards, which I'm just like, what? So how did you guys go from like drinking the Kool-Aid to realizing like, oh, this shit is toxic and I need to (laughs) use a different strategy? That's a great question. There were a couple big pivotal moments for us. The first one was during the COVID shutdowns, his stance on the shutdowns and the language he used surrounding workers during that time and their protections was pretty frustrating because I was leaving my home to go and work a serving job to try and make my family extra money. And some of the language he used about those minimum wage workers was pretty toxic and it didn't feel good because I was like, wait a minute, I'm consuming your content yet you make me feel bad. That doesn't help. And the second one that was a really big one for us was during the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent protests, some of the language he used on his podcast felt performative, for lack of a better word, and felt very safe and guarded. And at the point that we are in our lives with what we are trying to be for our children and be for our community, because we've maybe failed that in the past, we felt that we couldn't continue to consume that content and keep it in line with our morals and values. I want to take my hat off to y'all because it's very easy. I think in those situations when you don't necessarily feel like a, you know, current event that's happening in the world is relevant to you because it's not your lived experience to just pretend like eh, it doesn't matter. And I think we saw a lot of that during 2020 where some creators were just out taking a stance and some were just like, whatever, not my problem. I'm not here to talk about what's going on in the world. I'm just here to talk about money. And I think everybody has a right to show up how they want to show up on social media. But for me, I want to get to know more than just the surface level shit that you create as a influencer on social media. Like I want to know your values as a person. And so the fact that you guys are okay with sharing that and taking whatever heat comes with that, it's not an easy thing. And so I want to commend you, first of all. And I think it also requires some level of self-awareness to decide that just because this is the flavor of finance that you got started with doesn't mean that this is the thing that you need to continue with. And so once you realize like, okay, this is no longer aligned, how did you decide to pivot your consumption then of personal finance content? We cold turkey. We 
deleted. <laughs> just cut him off. You said, fuck Dave, yeah. we're done. Cut him yep. off. I mean, when I say Janice, we were drinking the Kool-Aid, we were consuming his content for three hours a day. Because were y'all in Financial Peace University? We, we let we it, ma'am. We let it. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> we we taught Financial Peace University. There was a point where Justin applied to be a Ramsey personality. We were like in it, in it. In it. And wow. we were really able for a long time to separate. Like, okay, we don't agree with this guy on everything, but like we're just trying to get out of debt and he's helping us get there. So we'll just turn a blind eye. But those were the moments where we were like, no, this is it. We're done. So we deleted his podcasts and every one of his personalities, they all have their own podcasts too. So we disassociated. We unfollowed them. You could say we canceled Dave, <laughs> we canceled Dave Ramsey. <laughs> and it was really hard because we were like seven months into creating a podcast of episodes where we're just talking about here are the baby steps and <laughs> producing all this content, which is still out there. And I'm like, oh man, I hope no one starts from the beginning. because <laughs> That's not who we are now. But we publicly went out and said, this is our stance now. And I was actually terrified to do that because I thought our following and the people that were listening to our podcast just were following us because they wanted to hear our amazingly curated Dave Ramsey, us like reiterating what he says. And then I realized that's not what they wanted. They wanted to hear us. Just like you said, they wanted to know who we are, what we think. And it was that moment that our brand exploded. Yeah. Like it was kind of like mediocre until that point. And then people were like, oh, that's who you are. Now we hear you. Now we see you. You're actually there. This isn't just Dave Ramsey's little minions running around. So it wasn't the easiest, but then I was like, oh, this paid off. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what happens when you start showing up as your most authentic self and not how you think you got to show up on the internet. So that's a lesson for anybody who's thinking about becoming a content creator. Like start showing up as you. That's powerful stuff. Okay. What would be maybe your like top three tips for getting a handle on your debt situation? The first tip that I would say is probably the most important is just shining a light onto it. Whether that is by actually going into your bank account and looking at your debts, whether that's going onto one of those sites that actually shows you what your credit score is, whether that's opening those bill statements that you're worried about, it's really important to like sit with those feelings and to sit with that like, oh, I really don't like this or I'm really uncomfortable with this because you can't change those habits or those behaviors until you're honest with yourself about them, until you really get to that point where you've had enough of whatever it is. That's the first important thing. The second thing that I would say is just start tracking your expenses. Don't worry about making a budget or if you use the word spending plan or anything like that, don't worry about that stuff because that will come down the road. It doesn't have to happen tomorrow. It will get there. But as long as you're tracking your expenses, you can start to, again, shine a light on like, oh, interesting. I spent a lot in this area last month. I wonder why I did that. You can start kind of peeling back the curtains. Those are the first two things I'd say. What would you say is number three? For the third one, I would definitely say you need to sit down and look at the numbers and the debt and ask yourself, what got me into this situation? Was it me? Was it my behaviors? Was it my habits? Spending, shopping, was that it? Or was it a series of unfortunate events? Mm. Because there's a difference. And most of the time, there's a combination of both. Because when you're down, you just keep getting kicked over and over and over. But once you face the reason you got into debt, then it's much easier to identify those things when they come up, because they will come up again. So then you don't cycle right back into debt after you pay it off. Mm. That's really brilliant advice because I love the fact that y'all are both tactical and also like mindset oriented, which I mean, we have to understand that money just does what we tell it to do. And a lot of the times your mental health will have a direct impact on how you move with money. Like I know when I'm fucking depressed, I'm not meal prepping. We are doing Uber Eats. Okay, because ain't nobody got time to be fucking cooking when I just literally want to lay in bed and be depressed. Okay, so like, let's be honest about how integral that connection between your mental health and your money is. And I think that's one of the main things that frustrates me about personal finance personalities like Dave Ramsey, because he utilizes the mental aspect of things in a really toxic, negative way. 
like the shame and the guilt that you mentioned, Haley. So that shit doesn't serve anybody. And it, for me, it has a lot of connection with like religious undertones of just like, you're a morally deficient person because you have debt or because you got into credit card debt because you fucking lost your job or your mom got sick or whatever. And it's just like, come on, y'all. Like it's 2023. We can't believe that that's actually true anymore. It's dumb. So I want to talk a little bit more about the guilt that you mentioned, because you said that you were feeling that after the fact that you paid off debt, which is interesting to me, because I would feel like that would come in the beginning of the journey. I honestly think we were so into paying off debt. We were blind. We went in just like with the blinders on and everything else. It didn't matter. We we're going to do this. We had a goal. We are both Enneagram threes. We're very, very goal oriented. It came relatively easy to us, like I said, but the emotional part where it was like, but what got us here? That was a lot of shame that came afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, we had a lot of money. We spent a lot of money, but we didn't realize it was happening until it was done. Yeah. And when we took a step back and we were like, <laughs> you're meaning to say we spent $820,000 in three and a half years if you take what we spent and how much debt we got into, how did that happen? So once we sat down and we're like, how did this happen? What did we spend it on? We couldn't even say what we spent it on. I think a lot of the guilt as well came from this idea of why us? Why did I get this money? Why did we go into this debt? And why were we the lucky ones who were able to pay it off so fast? There's a lot of guilt that comes there too with like, wait a minute, there's so many people going through similar situations. And just because we hit this like super lucky stroke of neither of us got sick, nobody's car broke down, we're not single parents, we have a roof over our head, we've got friends and family that can support us. Why are we the lucky ones who didn't have to slug this out a little bit longer? And so there was guilt that came with that too, because we have friends now from following people in the community that have gone through the shits, that have gone through some really, really hard years. And we feel for them and we're like, wait a minute, why can't our journey be for everybody as well? And so we kind of had to wrestle with that idea of the difference in those paths. Yeah, I like to call that survivor's guilt because it's like, why me? Who am I to have the privilege to be able to do things like that? And I've definitely dealt with that too, just as a first generation wealth builder and being the first to like be financially independent in my whole family when my grandmother fucking graduated from like third grade. It's just like, who are we to be doing these things? And there's a healthy amount of like self-reflection that should come from just being in a position of privilege like that. But I think if you make it like that you don't deserve it, then that's when it becomes toxic. And when you're wrestling with those feelings, what you guys decided to do, which is to show up now for a community and like actually help people achieve what you have been able to achieve that's when the guilt starts to go away because you realize it's not just about like my own selfish privilege. It's like, I'm going to use my experience to hopefully help people avoid what I went through. And I'm not going to gatekeep this information and I'm going to actually like be of service. That for me has been very healing. And I'm wondering if that's been the same experience for you guys too. Oh, massively. I'm a former teacher and I left teaching to then take Price of Avocado Toast and create a financial coaching business alongside what we're doing with our podcast. And I had no idea there'd be such a demand for people wanting this information. For a while, it seemed like basic information. But then I realized, hey, this basic personal finance information, we didn't have it. And part of that shame process we were just talking about came from, wait, this wasn't all our fault. This is a generational thing. That doesn't mean we're placing the blame on our parents and grandparents, but they didn't have the knowledge either. So no one was teaching us what to do. Therefore, we got in a situation where we essentially won like lottery sized money and we blew it. Yeah. Therefore, no wonder that all happened. So I think it just, yeah, people need the information. It felt really good being able to be like, wow, this is what seems like basic personal finance knowledge, but a lot of people don't have that. Neither did we. Yeah. I think it also helps alleviate the guilt too when you start to follow people who have that same message of of you as like, don't shame yourself, don't beat yourself up, like life happens. That's when we started to, I think, remove some of that guilt too because because for the longest time we were following somebody who was guilting us and you you get into that situation where you don't think you're you have the value or you have the worth. And then you start to follow people who preach that into you every single day 
And that slowly starts to change that wiring in your brain to believe that you are worthy and you do have inherent value beyond what a dollar amount is in your bank account. It's really about curating that environment that's going to support the goals that you have in a healthy way. So I am so here for that. Now, I have a question for y'all because you are a married couple who started a family while you were in debt. And so a lot of people, I think, would wait until they were debt free because, I mean, from what I've heard, and you're on what, baby number three now, Haley? God bless you, okay? You are like, first of all, glowing, the most beautiful pregnant woman next to Rihanna. But the fact that kids are so damn expensive definitely forces some couples to make the decision like, are we going to have kids right now or are we going to focus on paying off debt? And you guys decided you're not going to wait. So tell me your thought process and how you decided that. That was our why. It was the rock bottom. I think you should, Justin, tell the rock bottom story about the pumpkin muffin situation because... I was seven months pregnant and we got in this big argument here. You talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Haley was seven months pregnant and I got home from my teaching job. She was already on maternity leave and she had gone to Costco that day and purchased pumpkin muffins. And I got home and was frustrated that she bought them because I didn't think we had an extra $7 in our bank account to be buying muffins. And mind you, I'm an idiot. So I started to complain to my seven month pregnant wife, which I obviously don't recommend for anybody. Because of that, like we had an argument about it and we realized we're not even arguing really about like this money spent. We're arguing at the fact that like, again, the person that I stood at the altar and was like, I love you. I'm crazy about you. I want to build a family with you. I'm worried about how she can maintain her health and her wellness during her pregnancy, which shouldn't ever be a worry. And so that kind of helped us realize we've got to get things cleaned up. I wanted a handful of kids in a handful of years, <laughs> and I didn't want to have huge age gaps, and we were pretty firm on that, but we got in this fight over this muffin while we're expecting our first child, and we're like, what are we doing fighting over $7? Like, this is pretty pathetic, and that's what really kickstarted the journey to be like, we have a kid coming. We need to get our financial shit together because it's not just going to be us. There's going to be someone else who's depending on us. And I wanted a bunch of kids and I wanted them close in age. And that was a huge why us why we even got started. I think that for those folks that are thinking, should I focus on debt or should I focus on a family? We are a resounding focus on your family. We've been really blessed in our fertility journey, and we've been so lucky that we've been able to conceive and have healthy babies, but that's just not the reality for everybody. And the longer that you wait, that might add more hurdles or more time to the process. And you may never be ready financially for a family, but if it's in your heart and it's something that you want, we are going to push anybody to go towards it. Your debt doesn't have any value on you as a human being. It'll be taken care of if you make it a priority later. But if family's the priority, we're a resounding yes for that. So we try and, and remind folks of that often. Like if that's your goal, go for it immediately. The debt will be there when you come back. Yeah, I love that messaging because life is not going to wait for you guys. It's like you're either going to let money control you or you're going to make decisions that are aligned with your future goals. And if that is having a family, then you will figure this shit out. I firmly believe that. Things just figure themselves out after you make the decision that that's the priority for you. <laughs> like, never argue with a pregnant woman about muffins. That's never. That's yeah. Don't be message. stupid. <laughs> yeah. Like, if nothing don't else. be wild. You, you are literally putting your life on the line right there. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> All right. So I want to know what's your best mindset tip? for folks who are dealing with debt, right? Because I think the default for a lot of us is just avoidance, right? But that's not actually going to fix your issue. So would you guys recommend like therapy? Do you do journaling? Like what's your mindset practice look like? I love affirmations about wealth and money and how we all are deserving. I have this post-it right here and it says, speak what you seek until you see what you say. And I think that came from Patrice Washington, if I'm remembering correctly. But like, just put those things out there all over stickers or post-it notes, write them down on your refrigerator. I think if you get into a mentality of like, I can handle this, I'm going to get through this, I will pay off my debt, I am deserving of abundance, it's gonna just come. 
I'm just going to echo that. I do an affirmation every morning in my classroom with my students where I ask them to repeat something back in first person tense. And I just basically say, you're important, you matter, you are loved. And they say it back, you know, I'm important, I matter, I'm loved. And I just think that speaking those words into ourselves is really important, whether it's about a money affirmation or whether it's simply an affirmation reminding yourself that you have value to the world, you have gifts to bring, people love you, you are joyful, anything like that, it's going to start to kind of affect your surroundings. I'm a big, big fan of that. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so there are a lot of couples, married or otherwise, that listen to this show, and not all of them are on the same page with money like y'all are. So for those couples who are polar fucking opposites when it comes to money, what advice do you have to actually like not let that be the thing that causes drama in the relationship? Finances are the number one cause for divorce for many people. I think that's when therapy is needed. When you really want to get on the same page financially and you're just not on the same page, having a third party, whether it's a therapist, some sort of counselor, a financial coach or a financial counselor, someone in your corner that can help you navigate that together is extremely powerful because you can't do it on your own and you can't convince your partner to be ready if they're not ready. And that's the hard (laughs) part. That goes for friends and family as well. You can't be like, hey, we're just going to wake up on some random Tuesday morning and pay off all of our debt. You good? Stop spending money. Okay. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. I think just from my own lens for the heteronormative couples out there, there's a lot of men with very fragile egos. And they are either uncomfortable with a strong woman or they're uncomfortable with their own masculinity, or they're uncomfortable with their own faults, and they need to approach those. And they need to sit with them and be very real. Because again, you promised you were going to work as a teammate. And when you try and do this like pseudo leader type stuff with somebody that you said was on an equal plane, it's just not going to work. It simply won't. So the sooner that you can address your masculinity and your ego problems, whether that's through therapy or some type of men's retreat where you are able to address that, whether that's working out or some other type of wellness that helps you work better as a teammate, the better your finances are going to go as a couple because you're going to be treating your partner as an equal. And there's unfortunately just a lot of men out there who struggle with that. Justin, do you have like a brother or cousin or something that's as self-aware as you are? Because I mean, like we need more of these types of men in the world. I'm just going to put that out there for all the single ladies. They're probably just like, where do I get one of those? Where? Tell me where. (laughs) I have a twin brother, but unfortunately he is married as well. But I think that he's probably helped, right? Because I have have another man in my life that I can talk to to help approach that. So thank you, though. That makes my heart feel really good. Thank you. (laughs) Acknowledging that society has conditioned both men and women and everybody in between to just like adopt these stupid ass roles as if it's the patriarchy, right? So just the idea that it's okay for women to make more than their partners. It's okay to be a stay-at-home dad. There's just so many different versions of what families can look like and optimizing your situation for whatever those goals are, like that's nobody else's business too. And I think that's important as a couple, like who gives a shit what anybody else has to say about how y'all want to operate in your home, what roles you want to play, who's going to make money, who's going to take care of the kids. Like you got to make that shit work for you. Cause at the end of the day, that's the partnership that matters, right? That's the opinions that matter. I think too, like for me, I've said it multiple times. Like I think it's sexy as hell that Haley is the breadwinner. I don't care if some dude wants to call me a beta or anything like that. Like, dude, my wife is making money and I got three kids, buddy. So I ain't hurting for anything. You know what I mean? (laughs) Dudes just have weird egos like that. Like, I'm like, celebrate it, man. You've got a moneymaker who's crushing it. Be proud. So I want to know, because I know for me, I never intended to be a freaking money coach. And that shit literally just happened by accident because people started DMing me on Instagram like, hey, can you teach me stuff? So was that your journey too? just like starting the podcast and people started asking you to work with them? A little yes and a little no. So we started the podcast and through our podcast originally happened through Instagram. We had this cold DM from this guy that was like, hey, I'm a financial coach. Let's hop on a Zoom and chat. And I'm like, absolutely not. I don't want anybody to sell me anything, but this guy seems hella cool. So let's get on Zoom and kind of see what happens. We ended up working with him. He was our financial coach and 
the third party experience was game changer for us. And he didn't tell us what to do. He simply was a sounding board for us to create ideas bigger than we even thought. Like we literally sold our house in California and relocated and decided to rent because we wanted to kind of like wipe out our debt and start fresh. And I think that working with our financial coach was what really ultimately led us to making that huge financial decision. And I was a teacher at the time, but I was on maternity leave for a while. And COVID-2020 working remotely, like distance teaching, this was a terrible time for so many people. I was living my dream. I was like, I get to be on Zoom and I don't have to leave my house. This is going to be pretty cool. How do I teach and not actually be around kids? (laughs) And I just toyed with the idea. Maybe I can teach people about finances. I don't really know what that looks like, but maybe I can take this thing that I enjoy with working remotely on Zoom and talking to people without actually being in a classroom and make it into something. And then Justin, one day on our podcast in late 2021 was like, hey guys, Haley's going to start a financial coaching business. And I was like, I am. And that's how it happened. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. He literally said, go girl, go. He did. He did. (laughs) Because I talked about it and I wanted to do it, but I was not going to make the move. And he pushed me off the cliff in the kindest way possible. And I'm really thankful he did because this has grown into something significantly larger than I could have ever even dreamed of. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That entrepreneurship money hits different from what I've heard. Oh, yeah. (laughs) From what I've heard. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So this has gotten to the point that now, Justin, you're actually joining the squad. So you guys are going to be able to now like going to be full time entrepreneurs because you started learning about money. What the fuck? Yeah, I know. It's it's wild. I don't think either of us ever thought it would get here, but it's such a blessing because we get to see people that are almost in our exact shoes from a few years ago and and walk with them in the journey and meet awesome people like you and other creators who are still help, helping teach us. I mean, it's just the biggest blessing. I, I don't know any other way to s- describe it. You tweeted yesterday about how podcasting changed your life, Janice. And I say that all the time. Podcasting changed my life. Now I get to actively work with people who actually want to learn, not just fourth grade boys that don't want to be in the classroom, (laughs) but I get to teach adults who want to learn about finances. And I have a hand in helping them change their lives. It's the coolest, most empowering thing ever to do what you love and to spread the joy of what I love. I have been manifesting Justin leaving his job for like a year. And it was initially a joke. Then I was like, wait, what would happen If we both went full on into this, Mm -hmm. like seriously, let's dream for a second. And yeah, now we're going to do it. And I can't say how excited I am. I'm so excited. (laughs) I am so excited for both of you. And the first thing that I think about when you say like the fact that you were able to do this is like you were able to pay over $130,000 worth of debt. Okay. Like you guys have lots of examples of making shit happen in situations where like most people would just be like, nah. I'm not even going to bother. So I think when you start building your inner confidence by making these, like hitting these incredible milestones, it just stacks up. Like you just start getting real ballsy in all areas of your life. And so I feel like this is the next natural step for you to create your dream jobs, right? Because you've gotten your finances to a place where you can think about that stuff. You're not in survival mode anymore. Janice, I want to give you a shout out because there's a lot of people out there that are still trying to preach to people about money, but maybe hide some of their own, you know, personal life around it. And you haven't done that. You've been very upfront with what you've gone through, what you're doing with your money, what you're trying to change for your family. And so we see that and we're like, damn, like that slice of life looks really cool. Like I want to recreate that for us. Obviously, you know, I'm not going to be going to buy space in Puerto Rico. Like I want to respect that, you know, but like what that looks like for us is us being home with our babies and making it work like that and spending more time with one another while we're young and have the energy and all of that. And so you've been a huge influence to us, even though I know you're, you may not be like, I'm an influencer, but like for us, you you do influence our life and the goals that we have. So I want to say thank you for putting that out in the space so others like us can consume it and feel joy from it. That means a lot. And it always reminds me of one of my favorite personal finance gurus, Ramit Sethi, where he talks about like 
creating your rich life. And it's such a personal thing of what that looks like, but just giving yourself permission to think about that stuff and then taking active steps to create that is so powerful. And you guys definitely took that first step by deciding I'm not going to be a prisoner to money anymore. I'm going to understand this shit. I'm going to figure this out. And now y'all are building a whole career out of this, which is just So exciting and mind-blowing. And I want folks to find out where they can follow you, how they can work with you, what you have coming up in store. Tell us all the things. We pretty much live on Instagram, but we are expanding through all of the social media realms. We are on pretty much all of the social medias at Price of Avocado Toast, and Twitter is at Price Avocado. Our website is going to be up and running here very, very soon. It's priceofavocadotoast.com. Our podcast, Price of Avocado Toast, <laughs> is found pretty much everywhere that where you listen to podcasts. Yeah. And we've got one-on-one coaching. We've got a community where people can connect with one another and have the money supports that they need, as well as like the mindset supports. And just in general, like we want to be the hype cheerleaders for anybody on their journey, whether or not they're working with us. So if people follow and DM, like we respond to those things because this shit is hard, as you know, and it can get really lonely and really difficult. And we want to make sure that people know they're not alone. So yeah. I love it. I want to thank y'all so much for being here and being some of my most favorite white people on planet earth. So (laughs) yes, we've made it. (laughs) Thanks, Janice. Absolutely. We're going to make sure to link all of your resources in the episode show notes. So y'all make sure that you check that out and please go and subscribe and listen to the Price of Avocado Toast podcast wherever you're listening to this one. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Thank you. Thanks.